uh, next up, right after lunch, uh, we've got um, Matt Stibbs. So Matt is the Interoperability Specialist for Urgent and Emergency Care at NHS Digital, and he's going to tell us how you're going to take those information models, terminology, put them together, and transfer them between places. So Matt. Thank you. Hi everybody, welcome back from lunch. Uh, lecture three, packaging, transferring and manipulating of data. Uh, so brief outline, I'm gonna do a quick recap of the two lectures from this morning, um, just to remind ourselves of the components that we've discussed. And then I'm gonna do a tour through uh, some of the foundations of moving data around and use some basic examples to illustrate that. Uh, we'll talk about some of the risks and considerations of moving data around and then I'll summarize at the end. Okay, so a quick recap. Um, lecture one, we heard Ian talk about information models and he told us how they can let us um, represent how different information concepts relate to each other. They give us context between specific information concepts, things like an assessment or a prescription. And we heard Di talk about clinical terminology and the fact that it gives us a way of representing specific clinical concepts, individual clinical concepts, things like a rash or an adverse reaction. And that's great, we have our information models and terminology um, to help us understand data, but how do we start moving that around? Well, actually there are many approaches to moving data around and I can't possibly cover all of them now, but I picked two that are particularly relevant to us in healthcare technology today. And the first I'm going to talk about is messaging. So what is messaging? Messaging we could describe as an event-based paradigm. And essentially with messaging, we would take specific chunks of data and turn them into messages and move them around in response to a specific need or trigger. It might be something that happens as part of a care pathway or something that a user needs to do. And it's particularly appropriate for operational interoperability. So by that I mean interoperability that supports the delivery of care, supports us doing real-time work. A good example of messaging, if we look at Michael's story, his um, GP receives a discharge summary from the hospital. Discharge summary is a good example of a message. And the event that triggers this message is the fact that he's discharged from hospital. It's going to contain some information about his stay in hospital, maybe his onward care needs. So there are a few key concepts we need to understand about messaging, and I'm going to run through a few of them. I'm going to start with XML and JSON. So let's define it first. XML stands for extensible markup language and JSON stands for JavaScript object notation. And you don't need to worry about those definition, definitions too much for today. But what we can say of both of those is that they are languages or syntaxes that we use to represent structured data so that we can easily move it around between different systems. Some common attributes of both XML and JSON are that they're both text-based standards. They use characters that we'd recognize, maybe from our computer keyboard. They both support hierarchical data. It means our data can go to many levels deep and it can be detailed. And they're both human readable, which is significant because it means they're easier for humans to work with as well as the machines that are processing it. Okay, so we'll have a look at some examples of XML and JSON. Um, we understand that they're ways of representing data, so we need some data to represent. So I've picked a, piece, a subject for us to represent. I like dogs, so I thought, why not? So I want you to keep this in your head as we go through the next few slides. So here we have two snippets of data. Both these snippets of data are representing the same information. On the left we have XML and on the right we have JSON. And those of you who've maybe worked with websites and have been involved with HTML might say, well, XML looks similar to that and that's absolutely correct. It's from the same family of syntaxes. And, uh, and JSON might be familiar to people who've worked with JavaScript and technologies like that. And both these syntaxes take the same approach in wrapping data. On the left, we can see that XML has wrapped our data in an opening and closing tag or labeled element. JSON takes the same approach, but it uses curly brackets to wrap our data at the start and at the end. And that's a common pattern with these syntaxes. Then within our data structures, we have several data fields. And the first field here is labeled here as color. And you can see on both sides how we identify that. And then next to that, we have the data value, which is brown in this case. The next field down is type. That's the name of the field. That's the label. And this is the data value that we have in that field, and so on for the other two fields. And having XML and JSON, 
allows us to represent this data. Um, there's no right or wrong answer as to which of those we should use. People may think that there is, but actually it really does depend on the situation in which we're trying to use them. It depends on the technology we're working with, the skills of the people, maybe the standards that we're trying to use. Um, but they do both give us a common representation of data structures. And that allows us to achieve a level of interoperability that we call structural interoperability. Structural interoperability defines the syntax of the data change, exchange, and it ensures that data exchanges between systems can be interpreted at the data field level. So by data field, I mean color or type or age. And that's great because it means the systems that read that data know how to extract it, but it isn't enough. Just being able to understand those four data fields doesn't give us meaning or context. When I showed you the snippets of data, the only reason that you knew they were about a dog is because I gave you that visual model with a dog in your head before we started talking about it, but actually there was nothing in that data that said it was a dog. It was just four individual data fields. So what we need is another level of interoperability, which we call semantic interoperability. And it's the ability of computer systems to exchange data with unambiguous shared meaning. And importantly, a shared meaning and a shared understanding that we've pre-agreed before we start transferring this data around. And this is where what we've heard from Ian and Di is so important. Information models and terminologies are the tools that allow us to have that unambiguous shared meaning. So let's use those tools to con construct a model around our dog. If we were going to create an information model for our dog, we might say that a dog has color, which actually is fur color, that's what we mean by that. A type, we mean breed, as opposed to vicious or happy. An age, which is in months, not years. We might have assumed it would be in years. And a sex, which is either male or female. And when we take that model and look at it alongside the data, we have meaning, we understand what it's trying to communicate to us. And then we can go one step further and we can add some terminologies into it. We can say that when we talk about color and fur color, we actually mean a value that comes from a list of fur colors. This is our a terminology. And we can say that when we say breed, we mean a value that comes from a list of breeds. So now we know at both ends what we're, what we're expecting to be in those fields. Okay, so we have some data represented with XML or JSON. Uh, we have some meaning to it, so we understand what it's telling us, but how do we start moving it around? That's where messages come in. And we can think of messages as being packages, essentially, for that data, a way of transporting it. And there are many different structures that we might use to build a message, but I'll talk about a, a common framework that we see a lot in healthcare technology. And that it looks something like this. A message as a package that has two main sections, a header and a body. And if we were to liken this to the physical world and liken our message to a piece of post you get through the door, we might say that the header contains information that you would have on the front of an envelope, maybe who it's being sent to, who the original sender was, when it was sent, or maybe even what type of content there is inside the message. And then we can liken the body to the inside of the envelope. It contains the actual information, the actual content that we're, we're moving. If we look at Michael's discharge summary as an example, this is where we would have those clinical details, the details about his stay and the details about his onward care needs. If we look at an example with some real, real XML, you don't need to worry about the content here too much, um, but focus on the structure, we can see that this piece of XML here has two, two parts to it. At the top, we have a header section and we have some data in there, metadata, data about the content. And then in the second section, we have the actual content that we're transferring, the main point of the message. So we've got messages, we know how to package them together, but actually what tells us how to construct those messages and where to put these things? Messaging standards help with that. And we have already heard a few terms mentioned today around messaging standards. Uh, and, I, and again, there are many out there that we could use, but I'm going to focus on just those that have come from HL7. So, HL7 is an organization, stands for Health Level 7, and it's an international not-for-profit organization. And their job is to set uh, a range of international standards that help us transfer healthcare-related data between different systems. Importantly, HL7 is not a standard in itself. The organizer, it's the organization that's responsible for setting those standards, but it's not, a, it's not one standard in itself. However, they are responsible for producing some standards. 
CDA is one of those standards, and you might recognise that, that um, acronym. It stands for Clinical Document Architecture. And the original um, intention of CDA was to represent a physical document as a record of care. So using our discharge summary example, that's a great example of a record of care for Michael. And that could be represented using a clinical document architecture message. Uh, CDA is opinionated. Actually, it says if you're going to use this standard, you will use XML because that's the, that's the syntax that, it, that we uh, respect. And it has its own information model as well as making use of other information models. And we have millions of CDA messages flowing around the NHS um, every year because actually it underpins a lot of our transfer of information in urgent and emergency care. Some extra bits about CDA. When a CDA was defined, it actually had three levels of interoperability defined. And this was in an attempt to recognise the fact that different systems have different levels of capability in terms of the data they're sharing. So very briefly, just looking through these, all three of these recognise that you have a header in the message. But at level one, the body contains just a blob. And we can think of that as a file attachment for an email. It might have a PDF or an image included there. Uh, the next level up expands on that, and it says, well, actually, in our body, we want to start to structure our data and organise it into buckets and put sections with headings in there that can help group that information. And then level three expands on that again and starts to make use of information models and coded data to give us a properly structured meaning. And it's the hardest level to achieve because it depends on all the things we've already talked about, that, that pre-agreed understanding of the data models. We've heard fire mentioned today, and I'm not going to talk a lot about this because at two o'clock we've got David Hay telling us a lot more about fire. It stands for Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. It's the latest standard that HL7 have produced. And fire describes itself as a set of resources to represent granular clinical concepts. We've got that phrase granular clinical concepts again. Um, and David will explain what we mean by that. It's designed for the modern web. It uses um, modern web standards, and that means that it's far more accessible to people trying to work with it. It's less dependent on some of the pri proprietary standards that we might have had previously. Uh, and in comparison to CDA, actually FIRE doesn't have an opinion on whether you use XML or JSON. It simply says, we're going to define the standards for both, and you choose which one suits your, suits your needs best. Lastly, third message standard actually one of the oldest ones that we have, HL7 V2. It's 20 years old, so it's been around for 20 years, and it's rarely used for new interoperability flows, but it's used in hospitals all over the country for their admit, discharge, and transfer messaging. So this is still, this is still providing, uh, supporting the provision of care today in the NHS. And by way of comparison to XML and JSON, which we saw earlier, this is an HL7 V2 message down here. And I'm sure there's a few of you in the audience who are reading this and say, oh, I know exactly what that's saying. But most of us are looking at that and thinking, I, I don't even know whether I'm supposed to start from the beginning or the end. So it really does illustrate the benefit of having a human readable data format like XML or JSON. OK, so we have some data, we have some messages, we've packaged it up, we have some standards to define that. How do we start moving it around? And this is where the concept of transports comes in. So, we can define transports as the methods with which we move the data from one system to another. It's a very broad description, but it will, it will do for the moment. And some examples of transports. Well, in our physical analogy of, the, of a letter and the post, it would be a post box and the Royal Mail, for instance. Uh, but in technology, we have a whole range of transport options available to us. Email is a transport. We're all used to using that, that second nature to us. That allows us to move messages from one place to another. A USB key actually is a type of transport. You can take some data, put it on a USB key, move it somewhere else and take the data off of it. You've moved the data around. Even a USB key requires standards because if you don't have a standard USB socket at both ends of that transfer, you can't actually get that data from place A to place B. And then we're in the healthcare sector. We have services like Mesh. It used to be called DTS. It may ring a bell to some people. Um, earlier, we heard Di talk about um, laboratory test results and those being those flying between organisations. And Mesh is actually the thing that that supports that every day in the NHS. And then in the modern web, we have 
HTTP, which is a protocol that allows you to view web pages in your web browser, but also allows us to have a system-to-system -system communication via things like APIs. So we'll talk about APIs briefly. So API stands for Application Programming Interface. And APIs are everywhere. They underpin the majority of online services and apps that we use nowadays. If Google Maps or CityMapper on your mobile phone or your mobile banking app on your tablet, they will all be making use of APIs in order to exchange data. They're basically connectors that allow two systems to talk to each other. We could define APIs as allowing us to do some core things. It allows us to ask a specific question of a system and get an answer. It allows us to send another system some information that we have, or send another system an instruction that we want it to carry out. We'll look at a, an example of that. So in Me Michael's story, he has a medication manager app on his mobile phone. Now we know that his medication records are not stored on his phone. That's not where the master list is. So his app needs to be able to get that latest list of medications. And so using an API, the app can send a message to the medication record asking a question, can I have a list of Michael's latest medications? And the API can send a message back to the app saying, yes, here is the list of latest medications that you can use. And the app can then take that and update what's on the screen and Michael can see that. And that can happen in real time every time Michael wants to see the latest list of medications. And that's just a very specific example of an API facilitating one piece of data exchange. But if we were to go through the whole of Michael's story, we'd find many examples just there of where APIs can underpin that kind of real-time data sharing. Okay, so we've had messages, message standards, transport methods for moving data, maybe APIs that we can use. It's not surprising to think that we might have a, a a scenario where different systems have implemented different ones. Different systems have picked different standards and different transports. And that can give us a bit of a problem. One way that we can tackle that is by using integration engines. And it's not the only way, but it is a way. And these are very common in big organizations like hospitals. Hospitals tend to have lots of different specialist systems that all need to exchange data about a common subject, for instance, a patient. Um, but not using the same standards. And an integration engine would sit in the middle of these systems and it understands lots of these standards and it understands lots of these transport methods. So it can say, well, if, you, if system A wants to exchange a message using HL7 V2, that's fine. I can talk to it using that. If system B wants to use HL7 Fire, that's also fine. I'll take the message from system A, I'll change it around, I'll do some transformation of the data and then I'll send it on to system B. And it means we're not waiting for every system to have implemented the same standard, which you know, could end up being costly and take a long time. OK, so I've talked about a messaging approach to sharing data. That's the first approach. I'm now going to talk about the bulk data transfer approach. And broadly, what we mean by bulk data transfer is taking a large collection of data and moving that collection of data in one go or in bulk. And in contrast to messaging, where we're taking specific chunks and doing it in response to an event, bulk data transfer is not going to be so relevant to um, supporting our live services or supporting us in real time. But it does have some uses. Data migration. Many of you will have been involved in some IT system change at some point in your organization. And it's almost guaranteed that moving from one system to another requires some data migration between those two systems. And that would have been done in bulk. Secondary use of data, using data for a purpose that wasn't its original intended purpose, can make use of a bulk data transfer. Things like research, analytics, dashboards and graphing, they can make use of taking some data and moving it. It doesn't have to be used for that and it, it's important to say that just because we can use bulk data transfer for research, it doesn't mean that that is the right thing to do. We have to look at each of, these, each of our use cases and work out what the right approach to that is. But look at an example of bulk data transfer. So sticking with the theme of medications through Michael's story, we could say that an example would be taking prescription records, maybe from many different systems, maybe from an entire country, and moving them in bulk to a place where we can start to work on them and maybe look at them, do some analysis or do some research. And 
We need a process to do that, and the process we generally use is ETL. And ETL stands for Extract, Transform, and Load. And it refers to a three-stage process, essentially, which involves extracting the data from a source, maybe doing some transformation to it. We might remove some bits. We might regroup it or resort it. And then putting that new shape of data into a destination database where we can continue to work on it and do what we need to with it. So to apply it to our example of prescribing data, we might collect prescribing data from many different systems responsible for prescribing. We might transform it, maybe remove the patient details because it's not really relevant to us. And then we can load it into a database where we can start to produce graphs or, and look at that data. And in the further reading materials that I send out, there'll be a link to a project that's actually done this with prescribing data for England. And it is a good example of how you can take that data and use it to visualize um, what's going on. But we talked about data transformation. Uh, I mentioned it when, uh, with integration engines, where it can tr transform data on the fly. We just talked about it as part of an ETL. There are some risks of data transformation, and we need to be aware that these are there. Every time we take data and move it from one place to another, and especially if we're changing that, we risk corrupting it, losing detail, maybe even adding in detail. We have to think about this when we're transforming. And if we want the transformation to happen automatically, we need rules. We need the systems to have transformation rules that we have to set. And an example of those rules are lookup tables. So if we, we might have two different sets of codes, and we want to move data from one set of code to another set of codes. And that's great if we can say, well, this code equals this code. But if we can't match those codes in meaning completely, we actually run the risk of saying, well, if we change this code to another code, we're going to remove some detail, or even worse, actually add some detail in that wasn't there. Ian this morning mentioned the, uh, the risk of having mismatched information models. And this does happen sometimes. But we need to be aware that if we're taking data that conforms to one information model, and we're transforming it, there is a risk that the, the destination information model won't respect the same data fields. And we might put field data in the wrong fields. We might conflate pieces of data. Um, or we might just lose them in the transformation. So we just need to be aware of this. There is no easy answer to data transformation at the moment. It takes time. It takes understanding of the data that we're moving around. and we just have to make sure that we build that into our process. OK, so lastly, there's just one topic I want to uh, touch on. And we heard Professor Rutta talk about this earlier. Um, and that is that interoperability needs service design. It's not just a technology problem. And by service design, what we mean is actually understanding what our users need, what services we're trying to provide, what the processes within our organizations are, all too often, as especially as technologists, we fall into the trap of thinking, well, we can just buy some interoperability and stick it in between our systems, and data will start flowing freely between them. And that isn't strictly true. There's actually some more that we have to do whenever we em embark on an interoperability project. We need to consider some specific things. We need to think, well, actually, are we making data available when we need to? And that's not just a technology question. That's actually a political question and a governance question. But we have to ask it. Are we speaking to our users to actually understand what information they need? How do we make sure they get the right information at the right time? And how do we make sure that we don't give them a load of information that they don't need? We've, we've learned the hard way many times before that if you just take information and put it in front of someone, assuming it's going to help, it does the exact opposite. Too much information makes it harder to make a good decision. So, if we're going to embark on these projects, it's not just an IT project. You will need to engage on all of these different angles if you want the interoperability to actually support uh, the work that you're doing. So in summary, three key points I think that we should take away. There's no one-size-fits-all solution for moving data around. There are different paradigms that we can use, and they, have different, uh, different, uh, they suit different needs. We need to look at our needs to work out what's most appropriate. Shared data doesn't mean shared understanding. If we want shared understanding, we have to have the pre-agreed models and the pre-agreed understanding to support that data. And interoperability is not just a technology challenge. This is not just an IT project. 
Interoperability is about the people, the processes and the organisation too. Thank you very much. <laughs>